Hello and welcome to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Over the last couple of days we've had a great time looking through 2 Samuel 6 and I said that 2 Samuel 6 is one of the most important but neglected passages in the Old Testament in terms of New Testament Christians because of the importance of the Ark of the Covenant and what the Ark symbolised. The easiest way to remember that, of course, is that David says he was dancing and worshipping before the Lord. And you go, well, how was he worshipping before the Lord? It's because the ark itself become representative of God's movement and God's presence with Israel. And so by Saul and others removing the ark from the presence of Israel, they were effectively removing God and their desire to have God from their very presence. So the ark became a symbol for the presence of God, a symbol for the remembering of God's past acts of deliverance, as well as remembering the word of God, which was contained often inside the box of the Ark of the Covenant. And so it's a complete demonstration that the Lord was a full part of their lives. And by removing it, they had removed God from Israel. And now David has brought the ark into Jerusalem. And as he starts to listen to God, as he starts to look at his own place that he's in, he starts to see a incongruence between the building that he lives in and the tent that houses the Ark of the Covenant. And so his motivation, I think, is to bring honour to God, to bring honour to the place where God would reside, and therefore to highlight the distance between him and God must be from God to him, not the other way around, that he starts to interpret that his house could infer between it and the tabernacle. It'd be a bit like if your church building was dilapidated, run down, no one cared about it, but everybody's church house was beautiful and spanking new and lots of renos. One may look in comparison to say the most important place that you worship in your life is the house. And David, I think, is wanting to avoid this and to actually communicate the opposite. The reading will come up, and then we'll have a look together at the first seven verses of 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1 through to the end of verse 7. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, I d- did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, whom you have not built, why have you not built me a house of cedar? So this passage makes it very clear. This is the beginning of easily in the second half of the Old Testament, the most important aspect of Israelite religious life, the role of the temple, the role of a central place of worship, a role where the people of God come, not merely to a tabernacle or a tent, but to a temple. And the role of the temple in ancient and modern Judaism is fundamentally important. And it does speak into the role of church, the role of a building, and the importance that we place on buildings and what they symbolize between us and God and what we think it represents about God. Many of the old churches have this uh, grandeur that makes it, obvious that we honor God because he is a God of importance, a God of otherness. But are there negatives that can come from that? The reverse can also be true, of course, and that is you downplay God so much, you bring him down to our level so much that there's little difference uh, between the outlook of a toilet block and some modern churches. And so our question is, what is the role played by a church building in the acts of worship and therefore What can we learn from our passage today and how God speaks into that context? Hopefully you saw in the first four verses that David's motivation is, I think, honourable. It is godly. He wants to make sure that God is honoured by the people because he knows that the truth of verses 5 to 7 
are part of his motivation that God replies to him. That is, the tent that housed the Ark of the Covenant had been moving around for years on a time from the Exodus onwards because the people of God have always been on the move, both through the time of the wilderness and the time of Judges in terms of the central place of worship that was in Israel. But now David has said, the promises that you made true, God, have seen by all of Israel to be answered yes, and we're no longer on the move. I've got a palace of cedar. I've got a palace right here. I'm in Jerusalem. We are in Jerusalem, God. You made this come true. Shouldn't you have a better looking place than I have? For they may think that we have a low God and a high view of people rather than a high God who we all worship. Now, pagan deities were often housed in temples, in pagan buildings. And I wonder whether that's part of the motivation behind God's answer. You can see his answer from verses 5 and onwards. He's basically saying, I was happy in the way that the past had been going, and it will not be for you to build this house. We'll know in long term that David passes the responsibility on to Solomon because that is God's will and wish to do so. But there are some interesting things we can learn about the nature of God in his respect to the temple or the house that he wishes to be housed in. Firstly, it's a house of his own design, not a house designed and came up with by man. It'll be in God's timing, it'll be God's design, and it'll be for God's purposes. In other words, God says, I can't be restricted by a building that you want to put me in. I'm not in the box of the ark. I will not be in a temple. I've been a God who's come freely to Egypt. I came freely to the wilderness. I came freely into the promised land, and I am in charge of where I go, how I go, and you are responding to me in worship. And so I think he's trying to get away from that idea that once we house him in a box, in a temple, that we may start to think that we can control God and limit God by the virtue that we are the ones in charge of the building. And God does not want that because it's wrong and it will lead to us thinking that we have more control than ever we could ever imagine to be true. Verses 5 and 6 speak about that reality. Verse 7 says, Where, Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? The answer in rhetoric fashion is no. God has not commanded that. When he does command it, it will happen. It won't happen by virtue of yourself commanding it. And I think the interesting thing here is how God introduces a beautiful phrase which has been used in other parts of the Old Testament but starts to come to key fruition with the simultaneous use as we go forward in Israelite history of shepherd and king. Did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd? So the command of the king has been to shepherd his people, to guide his people as the Lord has come out and guided his people. So the king is a representative of that guiding motif that God has. To shepherd is to steer on the right course. A shepherd is to pastor the people with justice and truth. A shepherd is to have compassion and love and a desire for the best for those who are under his care. And God says, that is the role of the king. I want you to be that type of king, David. You let me handle when I build the temple. And so for churches, for buildings... Our task, yes, is to build in order to bring honour to God, but ostensibly our task is not to worship the building, but to be people who shepherd others whilst we use the building. The building becomes the vehicle by which we help others know about the shepherd, know about the Lord Jesus, to know about the character of God, and that God is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, as David says in Psalm 23, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, he guides, he cares, he leads, he rules, he pastors. And we do that in buildings, we do that in homes, we do that everywhere. A building does become an important symbol of how we do represent God to this world. But it is only a symbol. The reality is measured by how we love our Father, love one another, and represent God to each other. That is the fundamental importance of how a building can be used to shepherd God's people and to love God. Amen.